formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. So everything's coming out of the ground. You know, you think about the periodic table of elements. Okay, where does all that come from? It comes from the ground. Okay? And we are made up of the periodic table of elements. In fact, the, the major element that we're made up of is carbon. Isn't that cool? Um, now, the serpent. Okay, so now there's something here I want you to catch is that the atheist will say that there's a contradiction going on here. Because here God was talking about creating the animals in, the, in these certain verses out of the ground. And then he seemed to talk about it again. And it seems like there, there's some type of a contradiction. And the atheists will point at this. They'll say, well, God talked about plant or creating the animals and the plants in this chapter, in this verse. But then he seems to be doing it again in this other chapter and other verses. No, there's no contradiction. Because, see, here's what God did. First, he created the earth, all the animals, and everything in it. But then, he created the Garden of Eden within the earth. So it would be kind of like if you got some land, and you talked about how you developed the land, now you're going to put a house on it. Okay, there's no contradiction there. You're just adding something to it. Okay, so God added the Garden of Eden to what he's already created. So when God created the, the Garden of Eden, He simply created more plants within that garden. See? So there's no contradiction. You just need to watch out for that when you go to college. Um, now, in uh, uh, Genesis 3.1, Now the serpent was more subtle, that means deceptive, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, kids, do you know what's being suggested here? I just want to ask you. We can get some uh, classroom participation here. What is being suggested by this verse? I'm going to give you five seconds, then I'm going to turn it over to the adults. What do you see here that's really odd? It's really odd. What's being suggested? Well, now wait a second. You're not a kid yet. Oh. Oh, my five seconds are long. I'm gonna get. <laughs> okay, you going once, going twice, going three times. Okay, adults, what is it? The, the serpent was talking. The serpent was talking. Now wait a second. Hold on here. Now, if a snake came up to me and started talking. I'm going to be out of there. I'm already, I already don't care to handle snakes, but to have a talking snake, that's going to bother the tar out of me and I'm going to run. Eve didn't run. Why was she not scared? Well, you know what's being suggested here? Animals talk before the fall. I imagine that God had given animals the ability to talk before the fall. This didn't seem to bother Eve. It didn't seem to bother Adam. And so, so the serpent, now you have to remember though, this serpent wasn't a snake yet. It hadn't turned into a snake. So whatever this thing was, it could walk, and it was maybe up in a tree or something, but it could walk, and it was beautiful, and it was not uncommon for Eve to talk to the animals, especially to the serpent. Okay? Um... So, and he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And you see, this is the problem that we see today in, among the human race. The human race says, Oh, I don't believe the Bible. Because there, too many people have too many different opinions about it. You've got all these different kinds of churches. You've got all these different kinds of colleges. They're all teaching something different. And you know what I say to that? I say, well, that's no different than any secular college you're going to go to. Nobody, doesn't matter if you're a church person or not, nobody agrees with each other. However, we don't interpret the Bible. We let the Bible speak for itself. That's what we're supposed to do. But the problem is our biases get in there and, you know, mess things up. Um, Okay, and the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, 
neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Um, and the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, and your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You see, this is where God is giving Adam and Eve a choice whether to serve God or not. Um, this, so, God doesn't make robots. He already knew what Adam and Eve were going to do. He knew what they were going to do because he foreknew. And Satan, he says, ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. So that was the first time, the first mention, when Satan would make something evil, he would take something evil and make it look good, and something that is good make it look evil. And that is what we deal with every day. And you see, man has chosen his way, and this is why we have all the wars and the violence. Look, if, you, you, if you're a public school teacher and you teach kids that you're just an over-glorified ape that evolved from a hunk of protoplasm, then don't get too upset with them then when they bring a gun to school and start shooting everybody. Because you're part of the problem. You're the one that's teaching them to shoot everybody because you taught them they were apes. Hey, look, animals, animals, they hunt each other. They kill each other whenever they want to. You'll notice that we have hunting seasons, but we don't, why don't we have hunting seasons for human beings? I mean, it would make sense. If you believed in evolution, why would it be wrong for me to go buy a hunting license to hunt another human? Because after all, you're just an animal. I had a college teacher actually say that we are human animals. That came right out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask him, well, if we're just human animals, then why can't I hunt you? I have a gun. Why don't you start running? I'll give you a fair chance. You start running through the trees and the bushes. I'm going to have target practice on you. I wish I could have got to say that to him. But you can see how the world has made themselves look like such fools. That's why the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So you have to be a fool to believe in evolution. And when you believe in evolution, then don't get upset with God when there's wars and rumors of wars, when there's death and disease and all that. Man has chosen it. They choose to obey man instead of God. Okay. Um, okay, now summarizing the introduction. God gives man a will, creates everything perfectly. God gives man the responsibility to serve God. Okay, get that? God creates man and woman. God gives man and woman dominion over nature. Then man sins. Man sins. Man makes God responsible for man's sin. You see how everything now flip-flops? This is why we have the problems in the world that we do. Nature then rebels against man. Because now look at this, people. When, God, when Adam sinned against God, he sinned against nature. Did you get that? Actually sinned against nature. Because when God, or when Adam, when he sinned, what did God say? He says, the ground is cursed and you, you are going to work by the sweat of your brow. So now the ground is rebelling against mankind because of man's sin. Okay, so we talk so much about leaving a better planet to our kids that we forget about leaving better kids to this planet. Educate your children. Say no to them every once in a while. It'd be good for them. Yes. Okay, now, number two. Earth is like the Titanic. Jesus did not come to make this place a better place to go to hell from. Right. Now, that hurts all your, um, your social... Oh, boy. What do you call them? Socialists, but there's another word for it. Hmm? Social justice. Yeah, this really hurts the social justice crowd. Because the social justice crowd wants to make this pe a place a better place to go to hell from. I was at a church a while back, and they had some speakers. They, these people, they considered themselves to be missionaries, and they wanted, 
they, their whole goal was to help get girls out of sex trafficking. Well, that was all real nice and everything, but there was not one word said about teaching them the gospel. Mm. It doesn't do any good to get people out of something that's bad if you're not sharing the gospel. You got to teach the gospel, otherwise you've only solved a temporary problem. Right. See, that's why the Bible says it is better that your eyes be gouged out, it's better your arms be cut off, and go into heaven maimed than to go into hell with all of your faculties. That's how important the gospel is. The gospel is so important that God, he actually said, he says, let the dead bury their dead. Because people are always making up excuses for not going out and teaching the gospel. We, we make up these excuses, we say, well, we're busy. We're busy. Well, I, I got to do this first. Well, my father just died and I need to go bury him. And Jesus, he says, well, no, let the dead bury their dead. Because people make up excuses. You know, when my, my wife passed away, now I know everybody's different and everybody's going to grieve differently, but it was just like a few days after she had passed away, I'm sitting there on the, on the couch. I'm still in shock. I was in shock for several days. And, and I, I was just sitting there and I says, you know what? I can't do this. I need to be busy. I'm not going to just sit here and grieve and grieve and grieve. I got to get busy. I need to go do something. And I'm going to tell you that was the best thing I could do was to go get busy. And I know that's what Beth would have wanted. I'm not going to just sit there with a black veil over my head for the next several months. You know, I was looking up in the Old Testament. Let's see, who was he? One of the guys died. And what was he? His name was Aaron, I think. Somebody died there in the children of Israel, and they mourned for 30 days and 30 nights. Once the 30 days was over, they got going again. You see? And so, um, I know that some people, when they grieve, they want to close themselves off from everybody. They don't want to have anything to do with anybody for the longest time. That was not me. In fact, I was totally the opposite. I wanted to be around everybody. In fact, I got more active in church. I tried to get more active in the Creation Science Club uh, uh, because I just didn't want to sit there and just think about this because this is just going to tear me up. And uh, it felt good getting out and I did a lot of hiking. In fact, you don't know all the people that I talked to about the Lord since my wife passed away. I've been talking to a lot of people. I mean, it really spurred me on. It gave me a kick right in the rear end. And, uh, and <clears throat> I've been getting a lot of opportunities to witness to people. I'm going to tell you this one story. Um, man, I don't know how much time we have left. And we're not even half done. But anyway, it was just a few days after Beth went to heaven. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to go down the, the, the White Bluffs area along the Columbia River. And I'm going to see if I cannot get permission to hunt mammoth bones from one of the residents that's up there in the hills because I know there's mammoth bones along the White Bluffs. So I'm driving along the gravel road. The, the Columbia River is to my right and I'm, I'm going towards Pasco on this gravel road. And I noticed there was a family right down there, down there, they're having a picnic. Normally I would never do this. But I'm telling you, I just had this uh, amazing bravery that came out of nowhere. I stopped my car. I thought, I'm going to go talk to these people. So I went down there. I says, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And one of the guys, he says, sure, come on down. And so I went down there through the weeds on this little trail, down to the river, down there. And there was this family. They had picnic tables. And they were just finishing up their eating. And I, I says, um, or I asked him, I says, do you own this house up here, up on the hill? He says, yeah, that's my house. I says, well, I think you have mammoth bones on your property. And of course, you can imagine the weird look he gave me. <laughs> he says, oh, really? I says, yeah, I think you do. And uh, I says, now look at these rocks you have here on, uh, just below your house, all these round rocks. I says, those rocks are not river rocks. Those are flood deposits. And then it got quiet. And you could just hear him really thinking. And he says, well, what flood are you talking about? I says, well, there were two floods. I says, there was the Missoula flood, and there was Noah's flood. 
And he says, really, you believe in Noah's flood? He says, man, that's great. He says, I actually teach on Noah's flood. Hmm. It turns out he goes to church. I don't know um, if he was really a believer or not because of the kind of church he came from. Because, some, because I'm going to tell you, there are some churches that are right on the creation account, but they believe in baptism for salvation. And I think that that was the type of church he was going to. And anyway, we became really good friends. And, and uh, he actually invited me up to his house and we watched a creation science video together. Hmm. Uh, one on the flood. And he gave me permission to hunt uh, mammoth fossils on his property. And so anyway, I don't know, ever since Beth passed away, I just, I just have this, uh, I don't know, I just don't have a whole lot of fear confronting people anymore. So, um, now, where were we? Okay, Jesus did not, yeah. So, Jesus did not come here to make this place a better place to go to hell from. And so it is the gospel that we have to be sharing because this earth is like the Titanic. Now, the, now, what I've been told through history books is that the people that designed the Titanic, they actually said that not even God can sink this ship. I don't think that's a good idea to say. <laughs> because, I don't know, I think God had something to do with this. So the ship hits an iceberg, huge, creates this huge gaping hole, and so the, the ship hits the iceberg, many people are warned of impending disaster, Many people laugh at the people who are warning about the impending disaster. Instead, they would rather be social justice people and believe that we can fix the Titanic. Stop it from sinking. Well, nobody did. Some people become terrified and listen, listen to the warning and get into the lifeboats. So there wasn't enough lifeboats for everybody. But everybody that believed that they were going to sink, they were able to find themselves a lifeboat. The other people that were laughing, they were scoffing at the people who were warning about the impending doom, they died. It's just like Bible prophecy. It's just like what's going on today. Okay, so Proverbs 9.10 it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. I've been talking to my boss a lot about the Lord lately. And I want to tell you something. I've got this big picture of this fossil fish. One fish swallowing the other fish in my office at my work. And people will come in and they will see that picture. Boy, that's a great evangelistic tool. I had an agnostic come in. And, and the guy, he looked at it and he says, oh, so that's the picture you've been telling me about. I says, yes, it is. I says, what you've got there is you've got a big fish swallowing the other fish and it's fossilized. I says, this proves rapid burial. This proves that these two fish, they were minding their own business. One was swallowing the other fish and bam, that one fish, that, those two fish, they got hit by a turbidity current. In other words, an underwater landslide, it overwhelmed them so fast, they had no time to think and they woke up dead. And so you will notice that the fins are still extracted. I, I says, this here, my friend, is proof of Noah's flood, of a universal disaster. You know what he did when I said that? He turned his back on the picture and he continued to eat his lunch. He couldn't look at that picture because he knew that picture was very convicting. And then we, then we ask the dumb question, if God is so powerful and loving, why does he allow death and suffering? Well, it's because of the dumb choices you're making. You made the choice. You turned your back on the picture. There you go. You're not repenting like you should be. And if, we, and if the whole world would just repent, we probably wouldn't see so many bad things happening. Um, and so, once again, it is a choice. Okay, number three. Was God unjust sending the flood? You know, a lot of atheists and agnostics, they will say, well, God must be a hateful God. Because look at all the women and children. Yeah, they always like to bring in the women and the children. They say, look at all the women and, women and children that God hit, killed. All the innocent ones. I'm thinking, well, what do you care? You're for abortion, you know? And, uh, and so, but I, but I say, this is what I say to him. I say, but you're contradicting yourself again. I said, I would be willing to bet money you're probably also mad at God that, you, that he allowed Hitler to be born. And nowadays it would be Putin to be born. 
And, uh, um, oh man, I didn't remember the name of this guy. So, look at all these uh, serial killers. These are the 11 worst serial killers in, the U in U.S. history right there. They just caught this guy. It took them over 40 years to finally get this guy here. He started his career, uh, uh, career in crime in 1976. They didn't catch him until 2018. And they finally convicted him in 2020. Um, and so, the, so, I would, so I would say to the unbeliever, I would say, but you get mad though at God out the other side of your mouth because you would say, well, why does he allow all this death and suffering? I says, well, you didn't like it when God destroyed the earth to stop all the death and suffering, but now, now you're upset with God when he allows these people to live. You see the contradiction? And then I would say to them, that's why God is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He sees the beginning from the ending and the ending from the beginning. And so he has his reasons for when he destroys a nation or when he destroys the earth. God is not fair, he is just. There, that answers the question. You know what? I get so tired of fairness because of how the world defines it. Fairness, according to the world, is if you hire two men, then you have to hire two women. If you hire two people that are five feet tall, then you've got to hire two people that are six feet tall. If you hire someone of some color, then you've got to hire someone of a different color. And it's not based upon performance, it's not based on education, it's not based on, on anything realistic, it's all based on the outward appearance, just like the Pharisees in the Bible. And um, Okay, we'll continue on. My mind just went blank there. So, they would get upset uh, with God allowing these people to be born. Right here. These are some of the, the most wicked... He, uh, rulers in human existence. Now there's some that are worse than them. I can't imagine getting worse. But you would get mad at God for allowing them to live, but then out to your other side of the mouth, you get mad at God for destroying the earth when the whole earth was wicked before God. That is with a flood. Okay, when we speak of evil, number four, in Psalms 14, 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And you see, so when, you, when you've got a generation of people that say that there is no God, these are the people that have the potential to do very, very evil. You know, the one thing that I like about the evolutionists of the 1800s is that they were a lot more honest about things. They would actually admit that the whole reason why we believe in evolution is for a philosophy, for philosophical reasons. You go back to the Old Testament, people back then were very honest as to why they did the evil things that they do, but today in our modern age we become very sophisticated and we justify the evil that we do. And we try to pretend that we don't even do evil. That's how it is right now in our times. We have become very sophisticated with the advancement of technology. Um, so, if there is no God, then how do we know what evil is? Then there is no ought. See, when you believe in God, you, you understand there are, there's ways in which things ought to be. You know that it, that Crime is bad. You know that taking a gun to school and shooting up people is bad. It ought not to be that way. Okay? But if you're an atheist, if you say that God does not exist, then everything is just time plus chance plus survival of the fittest. Then evil is just an accident and there's no way to define evil. Then everything is relative and you have to have the millions of gods running around with a million opinions deciding what is right and wrong. Then murder, rape, lying, and theft is not evil. It is just your personal preference. So unbelief, saying that God does not exist, everything then just becomes personal preference. The only reason why you believe that, that murder is wrong is just because, well, that's how you feel right now. 
That's how you feel. Um, then you have the tyranny of the majority. That's what we're seeing in this country now. We're seeing a lot of tyranny. We're seeing terrorist groups now uh, being formed in America. Uh, when we speak of evil, then what you're thinking right now cannot be trusted or be accurate because what you're thinking is just a whole bunch of random thoughts. Everything is just an accident, what you're thinking, because after all, we got here through accident, through an ape, and so what? So how can you trust what you're thinking? It's just made up of a bunch of random thoughts over millions of years. You're thinking it's just a bunch of random thoughts. You can never be sure of what you are thinking can be right. So you can't have it both ways. Um, when we speak of evil, we are saying it ought to be this way or that way, leading us to absolutes, not personal preference. So when an atheist says something is wrong, you say, wait a second, you just said this is wrong. That's your absolute. You said you don't believe in absolutes. How can you be sure of anything that is wrong if you say there is no God? Um, you cannot call any of those things evil because there is no way that the world ought to be if there is no God. The presence of evil. The presence of evil removes personal preference, leads us to God, leads us away from atheism. See, that's why in the middle of war, and I've never been in war, but you know, it's common sense. If you've got a bunch of soldiers and they're about ready to die and everybody's getting shot at, boy, people will get religious pretty quick. All of a sudden, now everybody wants to start praying. Because they know deep down inside that God does really exist. And once your back is against the wall, that's why God allows evil. If he didn't allow evil, nobody would bother to repent or think about the more important things of God. Um, James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So when you talk to somebody and they say, well, you know, my good works outweigh my bad works. As long as my good works outweigh my bad works, then I should be able to get to heaven. You really want to live by that? How do you know for sure that your good works are ever going to be, ever outdo your bad works? See, the Bible tells us, um, well, that's not the verse I wanted. Um, well, we'll just go with this. So, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So, we have the Ten Commandments. And when, when you break one law, like let's say, you know, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever bared false witness? Have you ever took God's name in vain? If you just broke one of those laws, then you have broken them all. And if you don't believe that, then there is no end to what you can do as a human being, as far as evil goes. Um, Ecclesiastes 7, 13-14. Consider the work of God. Ooh, okay. Um, Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? Have you ever tried to straighten out metal? You know, have you ever worked on a car, like a dent in, in a car uh, body? Um, when, when cars were made out of metal, and there was a dent in the corner panel of a car, and you tried to take that dent out, you'll notice it's almost impossible, and that's why they made Bondo to put over the dent. Because once it's dented, you cannot make it perfect anymore. Once something is bent, the, the more you try to straighten it out, the worse it gets. And that's what Solomon was saying here. Men with their best efforts trying to take something that is wrong and then try to correct it on their own, they just make it worse. And that's another reason why we have so much death and suffering is because man is constantly trying to fix his own problems without God. And so humanism is failing. Um, whoops. Let's see. Uh, verse 15, all things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Uh, what's wrong way? Because a sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. So see, a lot of people, they think, well, you know what? I've been stealing just like that one serial killer, that picture of that guy, and I cannot think of his name right now, but he got away with it for 40 years. 